Morning, everybody. Morning. We awake today? Yes. All right. We're going to hit one of those passages today that I call a what passage? Where you read it and you say, oh, okay. And then somebody says, what was that about? And you go, uh, uh, what? Um, so, today we talk about forgiveness. And our text is going to be from Luke 17. So watch yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Even if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times comes back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink, and after that you may eat and drink? Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. This is a, a passage that often gets uh, taken apart and used actually in other contexts. And there's a lot of, you know, the faith of the mustard seed and you can buy the little vial that's got the mustard seed in it and wear it around your neck and all those kind of things. But yeah, I think you have to keep it in the passage to figure out what is this thing talking about. So it can be a very difficult passage to understand, but the the principle in it is this. If this idea is not firm in your head and in your heart, it makes it very, very hard to live out the Christian life. Because everything in the world says that this is foolishness. When I'm wronged, I get revenge. I get him back. You go to the movies and the bad guys get shot and we feel good about it. You never go to the movie and the bad guy robs the bank and then the cops go, you know what, buddy, I, I forgive you, it's fine. That, that doesn't happen. But in the Christian life, something like that needs to. And it's easy to miss what's happening here. This part of it often throws folks. Even if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive him. You can get sidetracked here pretty easily. He's not talking about the number seven. It's not that, okay, I've kept track and my, my, this person has, has wronged me seven times, but this the time they did last week, that was number eight. No forgiveness. He's not talking about that. You can really get wrapped up. Because really, I mean, if you think about it, if somebody came, did something to you and, you know, and they, hey, I'm sorry, you'd be, oh, okay, no problem. But on t about time number five and six, you're thinking, you're not sorry. If you were, you wouldn't keep doing this. But he's not talking about a literal number seven. And it's way worse than you think. <laughs> the number seven was a perfect number in Middle Eastern culture. It was a number beyond which nothing more could be added. How many days in our week? Seven, right? The seventh day. It was this number of completeness so that if you, I said that, if you were at the, the home of some uh, Middle Eastern potentate and he invited you in for dinner and he said to you may you have seven fish he's not really saying may you eat seven fish or there's gonna be seven courses of fish what he's really saying is may you eat until you can have no more may you be completely filled that's what this number seven refers to so what Jesus really is saying is this if somebody wrongs you as completely as one person can wrong another, you forgive them. If you could think right now of the worst thing anybody could do to you, the worst thing, that's what he's talking about. It's not just minor transgressions, but the biggies, we don't forgive for that. The worst thing anybody could do, you must forgive them. Whatever that worst thing is, even that. So their reply of increase our faith that makes no sense to us when we, when we look at it in this light suddenly makes sense. It's another way of saying that, that's impossible. Jesus has just said to him, the worst thing anybody could do, you have to forgive him even for that. There, there's no way. I, who, could, who could ever do that? Who could ever forgive on that scale? I don't have the faith to do that. So the size of the challenge that Jesus gives us is huge. You know, if you think about that, it's huge. If somebody murders your parents, somebody murders your brother or your sister, 
even that. The size of the challenge is huge. But we can't turn away from the size of the challenge because of the size of the danger. We're going to take a little bit of a, a word study for a moment. Four old English words all from the same Anglo-Saxon root. Wrath. Wreath. Writhe. And wraith. So what is wrath? Well, it's an old time word for anger, but it's, it's more than that. What is a wreath? Well, it's, it's flowers or it's, or it's uh, branches or something that have been twisted into a shape. What is it to, the, to writhe? That's, that's to be so in pain that you, you twist on the ground. And so you begin to see it that wrath is not just anger, but it's anger that twists you. And wraith is probably one you're least familiar with. It's an, an, an old term for a kind of a ghost, and a very specific kind of ghost. It was the kind of ghost who had been wronged and could never forgive what had happened to them, and so they're destined to relive that and haunt the place wherever it happened. It's, it's this ghost that's eternity is completely put controlled by its past. And you begin to see it, that it's, it, this is what anger does to us. This is what unforgiveness does to us, is that it twists you. It changes you. It makes you more callous. It makes you more exacting. It makes your heart harder. And that's where it comes. And the danger is huge as we look at it. So that's why Jesus starts this discussion in, uh, discussion in verse 3 with this. So watch yourselves. What really happens when somebody does you wrong? You don't pay attention to yourself, you pay a lot of attention to them, right? That's how it comes out. But Jesus is telling you, when somebody wrongs you, alert! You're the one that's in danger. What do we typically do? Well, we reduce that person to what they did. You know, somebody lies, that person over there, he's just a liar. You know, or it's worth, he's just a liar. You know? It's, it, it's that we reduce them to what they did. But what about when it's us? Well, okay, I know I shouldn't have done it. I, I, you, you caught me in this lie. But it's complicated. You know, that's how we deal with it. You know, that person over there, he's just a liar. But when it's me, well, you know, there's this circumstance and that. And I, you know, I know I shouldn't have, but see, this was happening and I had to... We've got all kinds of excuses for it. We start rationalizing, but that person over there, that's all they are. They're just a liar. So you're this complex human being with all these facets, and they're a cartoon villain. They're somebody that's not complex. They're not a human being. They're just a liar. Miroslav Volf uh, wrote a book about forgiveness, and this is a quote from his book, Forgiveness flounders because I exclude the enemy from the community of humans, even as I exclude myself from the community of sinners. That's where our unforgiveness comes from. It's this idea that, well, I, I would never do that. Well, you might not do exactly that, but you're capable of it. Every one of us is. I can only stay angry at somebody if I believe I have some kind of higher nature. That person over there, they're just a liar, or they're just a thief, or they're just whatever. Oh, but, but uh, you know, I would never do such a thing. But I could totally do something like that. And the truth is I have. The sad truth is I probably will again. But if I, if I reduce that person to what they do, and I forget that they are part of the human race, same as me, they are part of either the community of believers or the community of sinners, just like me. I can forgive when I keep in mind that I'm just as capable of wronging others as they are of wronging me. So the practice of forgiveness, it's like, okay, really? The practice of it? This is... Is this really how we do this, this stuff? So this is my fancy stuff at the moment. But, well, you know, what about I, how I feel? I'm still mad at that person. You know? They, they clipped the hair on my bow when it was audition time, and they got the chair I should have had. They stuffed that piece of paper in my mouthpiece, and it actually happened to me at Texas Allstate auditions. 
<laughs> we'd all be in, I was like 20 of us in a room, and we'd all play right down the line with something, and everybody take a break, and I came back, and I go to blow my horn. And I look at, and here was a piece of paper wedged in there. I was so mad, there was no nervousness left. <laughs> Made all state that year. <laughs> but it, how, we live in a world that is so psychologized. Feelings are the most important thing. And we're going to get into that some tomorrow on, on a slightly different topic, but you guys live in a society that, that puts feelings above everything else, you know, as though your emotions are, should be the driving force of your life. You should always follow your passions. And, you know, it's, but the truth is that forgiveness is something that is acted upon before it's felt. It's not an act of your emotions. It's an act of your will. It is granted before it's felt. Not an emotion. It's an act of will. Okay, so how do I do it? Well, let's look for a moment at what we do when we don't forgive somebody. There's three main ways that we get back at somebody. If somebody's hurt you, you hurt them back. You know? All right. You know, you shove me aside to get into the lunch line. Okay. I'll be waiting when it's time to get down those stairs. Oops. You know, or you just do something to hurt them back. All right. So, or you talk badly about them. You know, to everybody you can. You make sure they see him in the same light that you do. He's just a liar. You should never trust him. Let me tell you what he did to me. But maybe the most subtle and probably the worst way we do it is that inward, outwardly you do nothing, but inwardly you root against them. Something happens bad in their life, and you go, yeah. And you feel good about it because they're getting their due. And you're the one being twisted. It's you getting twisted. The evil has come into your life. Because that's what we're doing. We're rooting against that person. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. That no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble. And by it many be defiled. That's what he's talking about. But that person is like, yeah, I'm glad that they, that happened to them. Because I feel like the debt's being paid, you know? They did this to me, and now that's happening to them, and man, I think that's great. And the sad part is that people who live like that see that in every part of their lives. They want to blame, like, the universe or God for things that go wrong in their life because this is how they live. And when something happens to them, something simple, you lose your keys. Oh, God's punishing me for this or that. It's just nonsense. But it's that sense of, of being twisted by your anger, warped into something else. And so the trick is this. We have to give up the right to repayment and pay it ourselves. And that's one. Would you guys read that with me? So we must give up our right to repayment and pay it ourselves. That's a, that's a huge and tall order. And there's a, a booklet on forgiveness written by this guy, Dan Hamilton. I've got a little excerpt here. Dan was engaged to a woman and she dumped him. And he realized that he could hurt her. He could talk her down. He could make her feel bad. But he realized that it would hurt if he didn't. It would cost him. And this is what he says about it. Once upon a time, I was engaged to a young woman who changed her mind. I forgave her, but in small sums paid over a year. Done whenever I spoke to her and refrained from rehashing the past. Done whenever I renounced jealousy and self-pity at seeing her with another man. Done when I praised her to others when I wanted to slice away at her reputation. Those were the payments, but she never saw them. Pain is the consequence of sin. Wood, nails, and pain are the currency of forgiveness, the love that heals. We all have those things which have hurt us. But they do not control who you are now and who you will be tomorrow. This is the point where I say, I'm not going to reach back. I'm not going to slash back at that person. I'm going to forgive. But the debt is still paid. It's just that we pay it. And we pay it. And the sin in this case, I mean, you know, it, I don't know what the sins were, but it doesn't have to be our sin that hurts us. It can be the sin of others. But that's where our forgiveness comes in. So what do we do? Do we just become human doormats? And whatever somebody does, that's fine. Well, that's not really loving either. Let's go back to our passage. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And some of you are going, yeah, rebuke. I like that. Yeah, rebuke. All right, but let, let's nail him. You know, if, if he said that, I'm going to go and tell him right to his face. 
But before I do, I need to check the parallel passage in Matthew 18. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. And that's why you go. It's not to get back at him, it's to win him back. That's the purpose of it. And if I go before, if I'm waiting to feel better about it, I don't feel better yet. Right? I haven't forgiven him yet if I'm letting my emotions deal with it. So why am I going? I'm not going to get him back. I'm going to get him back. And that's why the forgiveness comes first. It's an act of will in our hearts and our minds where we say we're going to let this go. Because I know that in different circumstances it might have been me. And then when we go with a pure heart, then you can win him back. Otherwise, you, you've got a fight on your hands that you can't win. So that's why you go. And I have to go with this in mind. But what if he doesn't repent? And what if he's not a fellow Christian? I mean, this says if your brother sins against you. So what about if this person's not a believer? Do I, 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 is it off the table? Now I really don't have to worry about this forgiveness stuff? Well... Matthew, <laughs> and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you. So it's not even that separation. You know, uh, Vaslav starts, starts about, he tells about the, uh, you know, forgiveness flounders when I exclude the other one from the, the community of humans. Well, sometimes it's like the, the community of believers. But I remember, this one is a brother or a sister in the Lord. And I go to him for that reason. But still, it's, even if I don't share that common faith, I still share a common humanity with that person. And I have to keep that in mind. The challenge is huge. No wonder they said increase our faith. No wonder. Jesus' reply is interesting. He gives them this. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. He's saying this seems impossible to you too. And he's not talking about faith in general, but faith in Jesus, faith, faith in Christ. As if to say, if you have the slightest idea of what I've done for you, you'll be able to forgive that person. Because the wrongs you have committed against me are far greater than anything they could possibly do to you. Anything that they could possibly do to you. So to put it all into perspective, he gives them a metaphor... And he gives them a parable before that. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing and lurking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now, sit down to eat. Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat. And after that, you can eat. Would he thank the servant because of what he has to do? Well, you have to understand, these are not servants as we think of them today. This was a way of paying debts. If you had a debt and you couldn't pay it, they could throw you in prison for the rest of your life until it's paid. Okay, so you work in the, you know, in the prison house or you just starve there. You just rot there. But this was a way to avoid that. That somebody could say, all right, you can work it off with me and you'll be my servant. And when the debt's paid, then you're, then you're off. But the deal is, until that debt is paid, you're on the clock. It's not that the master has given the servant... Uh, you know, the servant is not doing a favor for the master. The master is doing a favor for the servant. He's saying, this, I will not throw you in prison. I'll let you do this instead. And in the meantime, you get to eat good food and you have a nice house over your head and you can do all these kind of things and I will do this for you. So it's not that the servant is doing a favor at all. It was a way of paying a debt. So the servant should be thanking the master, not the other way around. It's the case of the servant acting like a king. Look what I've done for you. Shouldn't you be happy with me now? And Jesus then flips around on him. He's like, you know, if you had a servant, how'd you be? He says, so you, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. And they're saying, how, how could I possibly forgive like this? And he's saying, this is just, this is your, your duty as a servant. This is all there is. Don't think too much of ourselves when we forgive. You have to keep it in perspective. And the only way to keep myself from being a servant who acts like a king is to know the king who acts like a servant. This is the heart of it. This is where forgiveness comes from, is putting in mind what God has done through his son for us. The wrongs I've committed against my heavenly father are, would far outweigh anything somebody could do to me. Because anything that they do to me is transitory. What I've done to him is eternal. And he loves me anyway, and he forgives me anyway. Wow. Forgiveness is what heals us 
from the wounds that others inflict upon us. There's an interesting um, video making the circuits on the, the internet right now of a woman who was an Auschwitz survivor. She was a young girl when she went there and she, she managed to survive. And she talks about meeting up with one of the doctors from there and how she came to forgive him and actually wrote a letter of forgiveness to this guy who was one of the doctors under Mengele at Auschwitz. And the other survivors were angry at her for it. How could you possibly forgive him? They needed to keep that alive and kind of replay it in their minds and she was ready to go on with her life. And it's a fascinating video to, to listen to this woman explain how she came to forgive a Nazi torturer in a concentration camp that tortured her and her sister until her sister died and they murdered all the rest of her family. She was the only survivor. And it's, it's a fascinating thing. Louis Mead says it this way, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and to discover that the prisoner was you. It's a huge challenge, guys. And I understand that this is deep water and it probably goes against everything that the world is. I know it goes against everything the world will ever tell you. Because that, the world tells us, get them back. Bide your time, but you'll get them back sometime. Everything you see when you go to the movies is based on that same thing. Bad guy does something, and the good guys get them back. And they gun down all the other bad guys and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's, it is so ingrained in human nature. Revenge is not a thing that ever has to be taught. Ever has to be taught. You can ask any of the parents in the room who have young children, any of them. They, that's not something that has to be taught. They lash out when something doesn't go their way or somebody does, takes that thing from them, they will lash out. That's our human nature. That's easy. What Christ demands is, from us is something completely different. Would you guys pray with me? Father, we understand that this is a gigantic challenge. But Father, we, we understand that what you did for us is far bigger than anything we could do for somebody else. And even, even that most terrible thing that someone could do to us, even that, in light of your sacrifice for us, we can forgive that. I pray, Father, that you will let everybody here mull this over and ponder this in their hearts so that this forgiveness might be a characteristic that's evident to everyone in their lives. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your gift of your Son. In his name we pray, amen.